Hello, everybody, and welcome back to yet another Lean In session. I'm Michael Link here, and I'm the General Manager here at the Australian Institute of Architects. Welcome to a very special Lean In session today in the middle of National Reconciliation Week. Today's Lean In session will be run in conjunction with Reconciliation Conversations. This is an initiative that was launched by the Institute's New South Wales Chapters Reconciliation Working Group in May 2019. And this program consists of provocations of policy and project conversations focused on progressing reconciliation within the architectural profession across Australia. This reconciliation event series and the New South Wales Reconciliation Prize for Architecture is supported by Macquarie Group. And we sincerely thank our partner Macquarie Group for their ongoing support of our programs. Joining us today is Alison Page and Jonathan Jones. Now, this session is not chaired by me. I get a break today. This session is going to be chaired by Samantha Rich, who is a project design coordinator at Bill at Least Partnership and a member of our Institute's Reconciliation Working Group. So I'm gonna hand over to Samantha. That's it from me for today. Welcome, Samantha, and great to have you with us. Thanks, Michael. Hi, my name is Samantha Rich, and I'm a Rajari woman with ties to Karara and Yogara region. I would like to acknowledge the beautiful lands that we meet on today. I acknowledge that I'm meeting on Gadigal country of the Eora Nation and would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. I would like to acknowledge their continuing culture and knowledge that they contribute to the life of our city and region. Thank you for joining this Lean In session, which is our first in the National Reconciliation Week. This year's theme, In This Together, speaks to us on a whole nother level, especially after the past couple of months. However, this theme recognises that we have a role to play in, collect in collectively building relationships and communities that value Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's histories and cultures. As creators and designers, it is pertinent that we undertake this role to shape places and buildings that foster that. We have asked our speakers today to discuss their projects that have done this. And on that note, I am very excited to have the privilege of introducing these two amazing speakers, Jonathan Jones and Alison Page. Alison is a Wadi Wadi and Wulbunga woman from the UN. Yuan Nation and is a film producer, designer and artist who is motivated to tell Indigenous stories in multidisciplinary art forms. For over 20 years, her practice has spanned across architecture, interiors, sculpture, jewellery and now film. Her creative practice explores links between cultural identity, art and the built environment. As one of the three associates of Merrimah Design from 1995 to 1999, she has worked with Aboriginal communities in the delivery of culturally appropriate architectural services. She founded her own interior design studio in 1999 and has since completed projects spanning interiors, public art, installations and film. Jonathan Jones is a Rajri and Camilleroy artist, curator and researcher. As an artist, he works across a range of mediums from printmaking, drawing, sculpture, film, to creating site-specific art installations and interventions that engage Aboriginal practices, relationships, and knowledge. Jonathan's work advocates local knowledge systems and is grounded in research and builds on community aspirations. At the heart of his practice is the act of collaborating and many projects have seen his work uh, with other artists and communities. Jonathan has exhibited both internationally and interna uh, nationally and internationally, and his work has been collected by state, national, and international institutions. Jonathan will discuss his installation, Untitled Marawong Manawi, located at recently refurbished Hyde Park Barracks Museum in Sydney. And Alison will elaborate on her sculpture piece, The Eyes of the Land and the Sea, which she created with artist Nick Lehashik as part of Kamei. 2020, a project commemorating 250 years since the encounter between Aboriginal Australians and the crew of HMB Endeavour. Both artists' work promotes understanding and reflection on the different perspectives that we have of history and the varying cultural connections to place. And over to Alison. Thank you. Um, I too would like to acknowledge, I mean, I'm here, welcome everyone to my bedroom. It's great. Um, um, I'll have the Jonathans in your car. That's wicked. <laughs> um, 
Uh, yeah, I, so I'll just say Ginnage. I'm I'm here in Gumbangia country, um, up in Coffs Harbour. I've sort of lived here um, pretty much over 20 years now, even though my traditional land is spans from South Sydney, La Perouse, um, all the way down to Ewan country. My grandfather's country is down towards Eden, actually. And the project I'll talk to you today actually got me sort of working with those communities down that way, which is pretty cool. Um, yeah, Samantha, you gave a great background. I mean, you know, my history with the Institute's quite long, probably because of my involvement um, with the government architect under Chris Johnson, um, uh, working with Merrimah, working with Dylan and Kevin, who I'm sure you all know. Um, but I think that um, was fantastic background in, in the sense that we sort of threw we were always looking for that sort of convergence of storytelling in the built environment. And, and then I, I, I um, as my practice evolved over the last 20 years, I just got more and more into the storytelling aspect, um, which is why I, I pretty much work um, mostly in film. But the, but the project I want to talk about today is, um, uh, so for the last year, I've been getting right into uh, Captain Cook and Australia's True History. And I must say, it's been a really amazing um, journey in a way because uh, what's well, been a voyage of, my, of discovery for myself because I think all Australians have been pretty ripped off in terms of what history they're taught at school. I think our country has lied to us by omission. Not, not I think... Um, not, I think, maliciously or anything. I just think it's just by omission because there's been a massive part of our history that's been missing and that's that's pretty much the view from the shore. We, we, we understand the view from the ship. We understand... Um, we sort of do and we sort of don't. I mean, a lot of people get 1788 and 1770 mixed up. I think the fact that um, our Prime Minister announced that they were circumnavigating Australia with the endeavour... He announced that on the 26th of January, which is when the first fleet rolled in to um, Sydney Harbour, you know, just sort of illustrates, I think, just how much um, we, we all get it mixed up and what we don't, what we don't understand about our history. And that those fleeting encounters in 1770 um, were, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating story. It's an amazing story. I learned more about my spirituality, um, especially uh, a lot of Aboriginal beliefs about reincarnation um, from, from being commissioned for, for two projects. One of the projects was, um, so some of these slides I'll show you, uh, is a film that I've just completed that is um, opening next week at the National Museum of Australia. It's a short film called The Message. You can see that online actually. It's a new media artwork that I co-created with all of the descendants of the people who, uh, whose ancestors encountered Cook. So I think um, my work, I think since the architecture days, actually, our, my work's always been very collaborative in that way. And I've really into, um, you know, co-creating work with people from that place because I'm always telling stories of place. Um, yeah, just I'm going to really rush over this amazing story in 1770, but you, you know, really should, while you're in isolation, just immerse yourself in Australia's true history because there's a lot to glean from it and there's a lot to be proud of. There was amazing uh, acts of, of environmental activism that was happening in 1770, especially up in Cooktown. And, and, I, and I think that's why it led to Cook writing this amazing quote that he wrote when he sailed off the tip of um, Cape York. He wrote that Aboriginal people are the happiest people I have ever seen. The land and sea provide them everything they will ever need. They don't want our houses, our clothes. Like he actually goes on and on and on. And I think that's why really I just want to say from the outset that part of truth telling is to understand that Cook wasn't that bad a guy. You know, like he was a bit trigger happy with the gun and everything. But ultimately he was, and a lot of the communities that do understand his story and he encountered, they appreciate the fact that he was a working class man, he had six kids, you know, that he actually understood in 1770, this is a man from Georgian England, 
um, he understood a lot about Aboriginal cultural values. Um, sort of, this, sort of, he sort of understood then what the country is really only um, dawning on now. But the message, it's a very simple concept about um, a ship that is seen on the south coast of New South Wales, he, you know, he, he, when he, where he first sees land, and a warning is sent by smoke, by message stick, by all of our sophisticated um, communications all the way up the coast. When he, when, when he gets to, to Kame, um, he encounters two warriors who are there waiting for him. They, they're wearing ceremonial dress. They've been painted in this um, particular white ochre um, uh, patination, which represents the whale bones, because they believe that they are encountering the reincarnation of their ancestral totem, the whale, that died and its spirit went over the ocean and then came back with white skin. It comes back in a canoe um, and, and with, with fair skin. And so this message that was sent from, from down the south coast was, was basically that. And so the first words that were uttered uh, at Kame, at the, the, the very place where these two knowledge systems, these two cultures collided, the first words that were uttered was Wara Wara Wa. And they were yelling it out, Wara Wara Wa. And that had always been interpreted um, by history. And, you know, in fact, there's a monument down there that says Wara Wara Wa means go away. Um, but when you, you know, I've been working very closely with the Gajaga Foundation, um, the Ingray brothers at La Perouse, um, around, uh, around what is the truth of, of this word. And the true definition of Wara Wara Wa in the Dharawa language is these people are dead. So these warriors were saying, not, not to Cook and his men, they were saying to the mob who were hanging behind the grassy knoll, they were saying, these people are dead. These are your, these, this is the reincarnation of your, your dead ancestors. And look, it could explain why not one Aboriginal person all the way up the coast took one thing off Captain Cook or his men, even though, you know, his orders, he, he had to make friends, you know, and, and it's interesting for the eight days that he was at Kame, um, you know, he, they were ghosted. They were literally ghosted by my people because they just thought that they were the spirit people. And so, you know, I think it would have been a reasonably confusing eight days for Cook and Banks and, and his men because they sort of went, oh, I don't know, what was that about? because they just really didn't have that much interaction. And so this notion that, oh, maybe there could have been this true meeting of the minds, you know, two knowledge systems talking to one another. I mean, it would have been like an alien, like two alien, um, uh, two aliens coming together and expecting them to get along. It's, it, they're just coming from completely different worlds. But it's interesting, you know, now we're, you know, we, we sort of, as a nation, we're sort of standing on the beach now with Captain Cook and we do have this opportunity to have this amazing dialogue. But, you know, all the way up the coast, um, all the way, you know, there's an amazing story in Cooktown. You've got to get into the story I'm telling you. It's incredible. You know, they, they protested that Cook... Um, uh, they, 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 they were all getting along with our friends because Cook broke down in, in Cooktown. He was there for 48 days. I mean, they really thought they were going to die. Um, but they caught 12 female turtles during breeding season. And the Googie Yamatha people, they cracked the shits and they just lit a big fire around them. And, you know, there was this environmental protest going on in 1770, which I think is something that as a nation we should be proud of. This is our, the origin story of our modern nation. And it's something that is just so cool that, you know, I mean, the year three students will now be learning that, that, that true history, the view from the ship and the view from the shore. And I look, I'm just leading now into, um, I'm probably running out of time, Samantha, but I'll just tell you about the commission that I was doing at the same time as making this film with all of these amazing communities, you know, from the south coast of New South Wales all the way up to Bamiga. I won a commission to do a sculpture, which was pretty cool for me, like going back to the built environment because I hadn't done, I'd been 
pretty much exclusively filmmaking for five or six years and to get back into doing, uh, you know, to, to, to working, um, you know, with architects again was, and, and engineers again was great. Um, I really wanted to riff off that notion of the whale bones. And when I started, what the really beautiful thing that happened when I was doing this project, and I'm sure a lot of architects listening will appreciate when you come up with a concept and it just clicks into place. Um, I really wanted to represent the whale bones um, because I, I like the idea that it was like the X-ray of this ship as well, like that it was um, a ghost ship. Um, because these people were ghosts, right? Um, because I like the idea too that, um, so we, I wanted to just do these, this, this a, a array of, of whale bones, like as if they'd been left there on the beach, um, but also represented um, the ribs of, of the endeavour. Uh, and when I started overlaying um, and doing studies on whale bones and, and the tall ships and the construction of tall ships, it was really interesting, actually, that they are virtually identical. So it got me thinking, oh, maybe the Vikings, you know, who sort of started doing these designs were actually practising a bit of biomimicry because, they, you know, like as if they'd seen, you know, a big whale rib cage on the beach and then just started kind of designing ships around that because they were pretty identical, really. And as far as, um, you know, a design process goes, like it was, um, oh, it was a dream. I was working with Urban Art Projects, um, a really great crew of industrial designers there that I, I got to work with and we all just clicked, we got along and it was great. And, you know, when we, even when we were laying out, because we really wanted to put it at the landing place because it's so silent when you go to, Cam like when you go to Camay, when you go over to Cornell, it's just like, you know, it's a pretty waspy sort of place and, you know, there's lots of monuments there. Um, I'll just come back to that. There's, there's these big monuments to, um, to, you know, to Cork and Banks and everyone else and they're gigantic. And so we really needed to put something um, at that place. And I was really interested in the tidal zone because I felt like, you know, this is where the identity of modern Australia is, is um, it's somewhere in between the ship and the shore. Uh, it's in that tidal zone, I think, is where our, the identity of modern Australia sort of lies. And I love the idea that the water just became um, this medium that sort of played with it. So a lot, at high tide, it, it is, the base of it is underwater. Um, and it just really happens to kind of um, reflect the shadows at different times of the day really beautifully as well. So it sort of acts like a, a sundial sort of thing across the site. But, you know, like it was just a, a, it just, we didn't have to kind of, it wasn't a struggle, which was great because we had this impossible deadline because Scott Morrison really wanted to cut the river, which he, ne he never ended up doing anyway. So we ended up installing this just like, in total isolation, you know, and it sort of felt a little bit like, oh, great, I've done another project that no one's going to see and, yeah, good on you, great. <laughs> but um, I do hope that um, because inscribed in into the bronze uh, is, uh, you know, there's all the plants that Banks collected uh, there, not all of them, but some of them, but the um, language names of those plants are used and said, so I worked very um, closely with the Gajaga Foundation and some no knowledge keepers from the South Coast on finding the correct names for those because that was a nightmare in itself. Um, just some of the quotes from Cook uh, as well. I mean, personally, I love it when um, the tide's sort of coming up and lapping it. It's sort of leaving this stratification. It, so the ocean is leaving its mark like on the bronze already, which is really nice. It's only been here for a month. Um, but a lot of the quotes from Cook and, of course, that beautiful quote about Aboriginal people being the happiest people on earth is, is the centrepiece of, of the main rib, really. Um, and I worked with Sean Youngberry, who's a local Gwigal artist, to put, um, inscribe the, that that's actually the pattern that the two warriors were wearing on their legs that represents the whale bones um, when they met Cook. And so uh, I worked with him to sort of inscribe that into the bronze as well. But um, that's me. Uh, thanks, everyone. 
um, I hope you get down there to have a look at it. So, yeah, um, obviously first I'd like to acknowledge um, I'm actually away from home at the moment. I'm down um, on the outskirts of Melbourne um, working on a project at a quarry. So sorry for being in my car. Um, and um, thanks so much for having me. But also I'd like to obviously acknowledge um, that I'm on um, Wurundjeri country, um, which are part of the Kulin Nation um, down here in Melbourne. And um, I'd also like to acknowledge um, Sam and um, Alison too for um, sharing the screen, I guess, um, with us today, because um, it's great to see those projects. I hadn't seen that project. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful project. Congratulations, Alison. Um, another amazing project. Um, yeah, I'm really lucky I get to talk about a project that I too recently completed. Um, it's this project here that was at Sydney Hyde Park Barracks, um, which is probably a site very familiar with so many of you. It's such a significant building within Sydney's landscape um, and, and that colonial landscape and yeah, it presented a, a number of you know just a, it presented an opportunity for us to sort of really think about um, Aboriginal history and and heritage and and some of you would probably be aware too that you know um, this earlier this year the the um, High Park Barracks relaunched itself um, part of its sort of um, upgraded listings with UNESCO um, and had a whole refurbishment. So really significant kind of moment for Sydney Living Museums. Um, and they spent a, a lot of money on refurbishing the building, thinking about the exhibitions, thinking about the messaging that they were, they were sort of undertaking, which, um, sort of really briefly, you know, the things that I really responded to obviously were, um, there was a lot of work sort of done on the building and heritage work, but then the other sort of significant component of their, their refurbishment was the development of a, um, like a self-guided uh, tour. So people, when they come in, they put um, headphones on and look at a little screen and walk around the building. And without that, you can't really engage with the with the exhibition. So that, that notion of that digitization, like that very high, like, you know, one side of the coin in terms of heritage and then flipping over to this other, you know, trying to preserve and almost put like a bubble around this building were the two real things I was responding to. Um, so, when I was approached um, to look at the building, and that's not a that's not me in the foreground. Um, to look at the building, we came and um, I, I guess this: how does an Aboriginal person engage with our colonial history? Um, it is a, it's a yeah, it's a really difficult position to be in. Um, and it's one that I think is probably, you know, one that we really all need to bite into. Um, like Alison was saying, you know, th those stories are there for us all to um, really sort of engage and pull apart and think about, um, you know, the lens that we've that we've that we've often approached them with. Um, but th this building, um, for me, obviously represents an enormous shift in how we understood ourselves. Some of you might not know, but um, the, the clock, just for one example, you know, the clock in that building there is the first clock in Australia. So for over 60,000 years, Aboriginal people have been measuring time, measuring, um, you know, the world in a completely different way. And what happens when this building gets erected and this clock gets um, sort of put in such a public place and uh, and and so t time is almost introduced you know western time is introduced to this country through this building um, I mean obviously the other issues for this building is that it was part of Lachlan Macquarie's you know reform process where he was trying to get um, convicts to engage in work a, a lot more so these barracks were really sort of house those convicts so he could kind of get more work out of them. Um, and through that process, you know, this building then becomes a sort of epicentre, if you like, for a lot of the other sort of capital building works through Macquarie's vision um, for Sydney. Um, and, and probably the most significant in relation to, you know, for, for me and my family was the... Um, 
the crossing of the mountains. Um, so those, um, one of Lachlan Macquarie's sort of other sort of big sort of colonial projects was obviously forging a road, following a, a path through the mountains down into, um, down into um, what's known sort of today as Bathurst um, and the, the, the plains down there. Um, and I just, this is one of the first images, but this is this, um, and this is where my family's from, out near Bathurst. Um, and you get this amazing quote here from George Evans um, talking about how beautiful the country is, how amazing the landscape is. And for any of you who know that sort of colonial history, this represents an enormous moment for the colony because everyone's literally starving. Um, and, you know, to find fertile lands like this to start farming was, was such an important jump. Um, but then, of course, that's completely sort of um, tempered <laughs> with um, the, the next quote from William Cox, um, because it wasn't too long before um, they crossed the mountain that martial law was declared on Wiradjuri people. And so the military um, offence was sort of given and, um, you know, major massacres started to occur around that Bathurst region over that extraordinary land. So this building this history, this story is complicated, you know, and, and is difficult, is personal, um, and is, is, you know, for the most part, and, you know, sometimes I don't blame Australians, but, I mean, the easy thing to do would be to walk away from this. The easy thing to do would to be to ignore these colonial buildings as an Aboriginal person and not want anything to do with them. But... Um, yeah, you don't get to do the easy things in life, I guess. Um, so, so the project then started to develop and looking at what we could achieve on site. Um, this is obviously the site that we were looking at. What was always really interesting and something I'd encourage all of you to never, ever, ever do is to ask an Aboriginal person onto a project and then announce to them that there's no Aboriginal history here. Um, which I have to say happens to me all the time, um, that you get asked to look at a site or look at a story or to engage in something, but then sort of get told quite quickly that there is no Aboriginal history. Um, and, and, you know, we really need to remember that every inch of this country, um, every, you know, leaf, every grain of sand, every tree, everything, um, you know, is is within an Aboriginal worldview and has an enormous sort of history and cultural legacy connected to it. Um, so even though these colonial buildings kind of erected and plonked on top of the land, there's always these Aboriginal stories and histories and connections that um, are there and probably just aren't visible to everyone else. Um, but I, I really sort of encourage you all, um, you know, to really think about um, what country is, you know, I, I get really frustrated and, you know, I'm sure Alison does too, because it's, you know, mainly her, like people whose country is, forms part of our metropolitan boundaries. You know, people often say, yeah, I'm going out to country, um, which is really problematic. You know, every day um, you're in Australia, you're on country, um, you're engaging with someone's country. Um, just because you go out to a non-built um, environment doesn't mean you're not on country. And so they were some of the issues that we started to sort of, I guess, rub up against with this institution and how they kind of understood their Aboriginal stories and where they sat. Um, I, I did what I always started to do, which was just start to look at the collection, look at the history, look at the stories. Um, and I was... Um, really blown away with this little symbol, um, which is the, the king's broad arrow. Um, and so back in the day, the king would mark everything with his broad arrow, a much more elegant sort of um, arrow design. Um, and that denoted everything that related to the king's property. Um, it was very much donated, uh, you know, circulated around the time of... Um, when the king had parklands um, and, you know, animals um, or parklands, everything was marked with the king's arrow. And then obviously as colonialism sort of um, spewed out across the globe, um, this arrow, particularly in New South Wales and most penal colonies gets used as a, you know, like this way of branding everything as property of the crown. 
Um, and you see it here on everything from bricks to, you know, um, to, to, to clothing, to, um, you know, all the tools, everything um, that's owned by the Crown is marked with this little arrow. But I didn't see the arrow at first. Um, and, and when they were sort of showing me through the collection, I sort of politely nodded when they kept talking about this arrow, which I didn't see. Um, I kept seeing this little emu footprint. Um, I kept seeing this little um, foot um, across everything, which, and I'd sort of registered it. I, I mean, around the traps, I'd often seen, you know, on markers, on obelisks, on things around Sydney, you often see this little thing. And I guess I hadn't really um, picked up on the dialogue. But but for me, I immediately started to see a different story here. Um, and of course, emus um, within Aboriginal culture are extraordinarily important. Um, some of you might not know, but emus for, um, especially from where, where I'm from and, you know, that New South Wales, I know we really talk about, um, we, we use that idea of the emu as a really significant male role model. Um, cause the emu, once the mums laid those eggs, um, she goes and, um, cause she put so much effort into laying those eggs and the male emu comes in and he just takes over everything. Um, so he sits on the eggs, he incubates them, he help, ha helps hatch them. Um, and then as they're little fledglings, he looks after them as little chicks until they're ready to look after themselves. Um, and so in Aboriginal communities, um, when we, um, think about emus, they're often seen as really significant role models for Aboriginal men and what it is to be a good man in our community the, and the kind of qualities that we expect from men. Um, so a really um, significant shift. So I started to become really amused or kind of interested in the fact that we have this one symbol that two communities can see two different things in, but not only see two different things in, but also stood for two different stories. You know, we have this one being the convict story, which, you know, is about um, punishment. It's about violence. It's about extraordinary hardships um, that people were faced with as, as, as part of that convict enterprise. Um, and that idea that um, everything is sort of directed at um, the, the king. Um, so this sort of monarchy. Um, and you flip that over in the same image for another group of people can be talking about fatherhood and just being a really good dad and looking after your kids. Um, and that being one of the most significant things um, in your life, you know, that you can be. So we had these sort of two paradigms um, sort of meeting at this one symbol, um, this one sort of connection, if you like, of this broad arrow or the emu footprint. Um, and of course, you know, I, I was really interested in that notion of how we track time, um, and the emu, of course, also plays a really significant um, role within the emu in the sky. Um, some of you might not know, but that sort of um, the coal sack or the, that dark matter up in the sky is, is, is mapped out as an emu. Um, and that is a, one of the more significant um, time keepers um, within most Aboriginal communities. Um, so when that emu is running or when he's laying down, um, starts to tell you about what seasons the emus are in. Um, and again, this sort of sits in opposition, if you like, or in conversation um, with, with, um, with the clock. And I guess what I started to get interested in, which most of my work is interested in, is these intersections. You know, I come from a mixed family. Um, I'm really interested in how um, in how Aboriginal people often have kind of um, worked within systems, have pushed against systems, created new systems, pulled old ideas into new spaces. And it's in those moments of um, engagement, it's in those moments of connection, it's in those moments of communication that I think, like what Alison was saying before, we have the most to learn as Australians. Um, it's within those moments of sharing um, things that we probably have the most to benefit. And, and you know, I, I, I would dare say historically, you know, those difference of, differences have been used almost like crowbars to pull us apart um, and to pull Aboriginal history away from, you know, mainstream Australian history. But I would argue that we should be using those stories as, um, 
as connections. Um, and so this was just another sort of a really interesting idea of how um, those emus within that Sydney basin were one of the first things to get pushed out of the landscape. Interestingly enough, through the process of this project, I found out that emu isn't an Aboriginal word. Um, they think it's a, a word from, uh, from the Middle East. Um, and it's a word that describes a big bird. Um, it's not. It's not a word from here. But the interestingly, even though Australia sort of pushed out um, emus from the sort of Sydney landscape and immediate districts, um, that emu and that kangaroo still becomes this really important symbol within mainstream Australian society. Um, but what's interesting is that again, when we look at this image here of the Supreme of the Law Courts. Um, it's funny that it's used in this sort of scenario. Wouldn't it be great that when we look at this symbol and we look at Australia's emblem, we actually think about being a good dad, you know, and role modeling about around fatherhood, around what it means to be, you know, a man in the society um, and how we can improve, you know, our responsibilities. Um, so, so it becomes, a, I guess, a really interesting counterpoint. Um, some of those stories, I guess, for some of you, you might know, um, those connections and those relationships we have had throughout our, um, you know, through, throughout our histories, um, people like Benelong and Philip, obviously really contentious kind of relationship for a lot of community members. But I think when you look at the relationship they had, um, something was going on, you know, um, and there was a, a, a real strong bond between those two men. And then also Patagrang and Dawes, of course, um, engaging in some of that really early language um, exchange within Sydney um, on, on Dara or Dawes Point. So we've historically had these relationships. So we've historically had these conversations um, and they've continued throughout the ages. It's just we don't use these relationships as ways of understanding ourselves or our history. Um, these things also exist within our um, objects and collections. Um, so these these are just two random objects. These are um, this is Blackburn's um, whip, um, who was one of the first fleeters. Um, actually using one of the very few remaining um, or one of the very few historical Sydney objects, um, which is that club, um, to, make a, to make a whip, to make a cat of nine tails. Um, so this is even within our material objects, we have um, these moments of conversation. Um, and the other person, the other images there, of course, is probably well known to many of you is Annie Esme Timbri um, and all of those shell makers out at La Perouse um, who, um, once the Harbour Bridge was built, um, started creating these extraordinary little Harbour Bridge works with their traditional shell work um, and sort of fusing those stories together. Um, so within our communities, within everyday life, we have no problem um, talking about these mixed stories, talking about connections, looking at the reality of our lived experience. But when we look for that in our history books, it fails us. Um, and so when we came to make this work, um, it was really that conversation piece around that little arrow, that broad arrow, the emu footprint, um, that became the ability to sort of see this building in a different way. And I really wanted to sort of create almost like a carpet um, for this work to sit on. Um, for this building to sit on. And so we created this work, which was um, simply using um, two types of gravel. Um, the, the gravel, obviously, for those of you who know the site, there's always gravel in the yard in that sort of forecourt area. Um, so it was simply using the materials that they were already gonna re re replace as part of the restoration process. Um, but taking that material and doing something with it. Um, and so we simply created, um, I think it was about 2,000 little emu footprints right across the site. Um, the material itself was actually captured from, um, well, was taken from Radri country. So um, was, was taken from my country, was where, which is where most quarries are for this sort of material. This is this Cowra quartz, um, this Cowra white, they call it, um, which is just a quartz material. Um, and the other one is this Griffith or Riverina red. Um, so a really beautiful red material. Um, of course, the this, presented a problem because <laughs> how do I take 
you know, 20 tons of material and take it onto someone else's country um, and deposit it there. So even though it was material from my place, you know, what does it mean um, to pick material up and dump it? Um, and we, we decided to use, or well, not we decided, it became really obvious that obviously we needed to talk with local communities, but also have a way of, um, you know, I guess traditionally we don't have a system of, I mean, I don't know, maybe other mobs do but like I'd, I've never heard of elders telling us of how what are the cultural protocols around dumping 20 tons of stone in someone else's country that's just it's a new thing that we have to deal with it's a new story it's a new problem um that we need to work with um oh damn sorry I've jumped I'll, I might come back to that idea but this um this image here just shows you how to um how we ended up creating the work so we just moved in teams going through the space we had these little stencils um, and we laid that sort of 20 tonnes of material throughout the space. Um, finally, sort of enveloping the entire space in this, in this really, um, I mean, it kind of was one of those, it's one of those strange works that um, the Photoshop image that I created at the start actually ended up looking like <laughs> the final product. Um, but the, what we obviously were really keen on doing was thinking about how that site, um, what, what, what does it mean to create a, an artwork and how could it be permanent or temporary or how did it live and exist on the site? Um, and really central to the process of creating this work was this idea that for me was the work would be dissolved um, and get destroyed and get, um, I guess, mushed up into the site as people engaged with it. And I think that's, for me, that was really significant because um, the reality is you know, every time we do something on country, every time we build a building, every time we, you know, drive our car and burn more petrol, every time we engage with things, we are, you know, we are destroying something, you know, some, everything comes at a cost. Um, and so these buildings that are so sort of hell bent on, you know, um, retrieving, preserving and holding on to this colonial convict story, that afflicts something like 20% of Australia's population are convicts, but over half of our population are born overseas or have parents born overseas. And yet, you know, when we look at the figures, we, we seem to invest a lot of money and time into this colonial convict story. So the ability of, you know, I'm really interested in the fact that when we spend so much time looking at this convict story, what does it, what else are we sacrificing? What else are we stepping on? What are we destroying? Um, and so this work um, was really interested in the process of destruction. Um, so the preservation of the building, but the destruction of the artwork. Um, and so those two ideas sort of really, the idea of sort of trying to um, build in a cultural conversation around the, um, the bringing of that material down to Sydney and that destruction um, sort of catalyzed or sort of came together with these two dancers who were from, their mum's actually from Griffith um, and their dad's from Cowra. So they're connected to both those stones um, and they're two young girls who have been dancing and doing a little dance troupe. Um, and I got to work with them and they um, created a um, dance specifically for the site. Um, they spoke to and worked with local Gadigal elders, Uncle Chicka and Uncle Alan. Um, they talked about their process and they actually sort of shepherded the stones down from their country. Um, they came down with the stones, um, elders sort of smoked and looked after the stones. Um, Uncle Chica was there and Uncle Alan, um, and there was this almost exchange. Um, and then these girls came on site and they were the first girls to then um, dance over that, uh, over the ground. And you can start seeing some of the disruption that they caused um, as they started dancing. But they were the sort of welcoming and opening performance. Um, and then like most of my other projects, um, programming and creating the ability to sort of um, talk, um, engage, have conversations like we're doing now, um, even though it's me talking a lot, um, is really essential. Um, and so we had a whole bunch of um, free programmed events, people coming on site, having conversations, engaging new audiences, trying to get people there. Um, and of course, through that process of people engaging with the site, um, they obviously started destroying the artwork through their 
process. But what was really special was that as people were walking away with knowledge, with new ideas, with new information, you know, that was the exchange, you know, that you come onto the site and the site, um, you know, gets disrupted, but people come away with something. So these are just some of the events that you can see here starting to take place um, and slow the, um, oh, that's out of order, sorry. Um, slowly the work started to d disintegrate. Um, and you start seeing here where people just slowly starting to work on, walk on it, things starting to break up, the memory of that footprint still being there to the point where at the end of the process, um, um, we were meant to have a performance um, and, and a major public performance where everyone got to learn um, an emu dance, only, um, the COVID um, sort of lockdowns prevented us for the la from the last weekend of um, of doing programming, um, so we didn't get to do that. But this is the sort of result of um, of of the work slowly sort of being, um, I guess, not obliterated, but um, but sort of um, melded into the site, so that we had this story that was embedded in the site. Um, and so central with most of my most of my works now is work trying to work with people and I was really lucky to have um, a handful of um, young Indigenous invigilators. Sam was one of them, um, which was great, who every day we had someone on site um, to talk audiences through the meaning of this war at work, to talk audiences through the stories and ideas. And so what that meant was everyone walked away with knowledge. Um, so that this idea that um, as the work slowly sort of disintegrated, yeah, that there was this real dissemination of, of, of information. So that the artwork itself would always be remembered um, and that the artwork would, would sort of live on as almost like a, a, as, a, as a way of people talking. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan and Alison. Um, it was so amazing to kind of hear about um, both your projects. I obviously knew about Jonathan's, hence why I really wanted him to speak today, but it was really amazing to hear about Alison's um, project as well, which I think has kind of a lot of connections to the way that um, Jonathan has kind of pre presented his work as well, you know, bringing into place that kind of dual symbolism in order to start a conversation that engages, you know, both European or non-Indigenous people with Indigenous people, which I think has been really valuable to kind of engage everyone, not just kind of only engaging a portion of, of people. Um, so, you know, thank you so much for, for sharing that. I think it's so invaluable to hear um, how you guys are, you know, kind of engaging with this so that we can get some insight in how to kind of do this more often, especially, you know, within architecture and the built in bar in environment in general, because I think that, you know, um, I haven't been to Allison's yet, but I will, but definitely Hyde Park Barracks, you know, um, as Allison was saying, it's like, you know, I didn't know half of the histories that I've been learning in the last, you know, 10 years. And now I completely um, engage with Hyde Park Barracks and around that area completely differently. And I feel different and, and I can bring like other knowledge into that space. And I think that, you know, the more that we do that in this realm, in the architecture profession, the more that we can start building those conversations and start kind of bringing in things like, you know, artworks or buildings that connect more with, um, you know, this this broader history and, you know, the longest surviving culture um, that we have here in this country, engaging more with it, we will actually kind of create richer spaces. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Alison and, and Jonathan. If you have anything to say, um, please, please speak. <laughs> Oh, it's beautiful work, Jonathan. I mean, I'm such a fan of yours and, you know, I was just madly scribbling away while you were talking there, but I love that the artwork has danced in, back into, you know, like, it's like a dancing country back into the built environment, which I just think is really powerful. I, you know, I think... I think that convergence of our culture and the built environment is really interesting because... you like we have on one hand this imperative to repair song lines. So song lines are these amazing, this amazing web of knowledge that's overlaid over the land. So, and, and um, 
three-dimensional spaces become these these places of learning so when you go past that tree or that rock or that river you're supposed to remember all this this traditional knowledge and that's how we actually learn that's how we will be able to pass on vast amounts of ecological data without the written word and so so then it, it it's an obvious extension to that that if you have um, the built environment then and and something grown has been destroyed um, that that was a site of learning then you must replace that you know you must repair those song lines with the built environment so that's an interesting i think um I, I just really think that that's what that work jonathan is really kind of bringing back to the fore and then also what it does um is which i think is really interesting and so so we've got this deep history this traditional knowledge but then this contemporary history which some of it's really painful um, but I really think the country is ready to start talking about massacres. It's ready to start talking about this uncomfortable history because it's not our fault. You know, it's England's fault. <laughs> like it's totally England's fault. You know, and the way that convicts were treated was, was, was appalling. And, you know, we should address that. We should, we, do, we should be, you know, I mean, you can read Richard Flanagan novels and just, you know, and weep, you know, but... Um, but to me, I'm very interested in, and some of the work that um, landscape architects in the US are doing, like Walter Hood, he was over here um, last year speaking about truth telling and, and the built environment. And I think that they're really exciting sort of narratives to be, to be working with, because as Jonathan says, it's where those stories intersect that, that gives you both the counterpoint, which is fantastic for any creative, but also it's a, a springboard from which to build new narratives. Yeah, no, definitely. And I think too, I mean, that's just the reality of our situation. I mean, it was really interesting. So many Aboriginal people are descendant of convicts. Um, so how do they make sense of that site? Um, how do they come to terms with a site that sort of favours one over the other. Um, so we do need to, yeah, I mean, we do need to create these spaces where we can have these much more complex conversations um, and, you know, potentially start to think about the world in a, a, a much more dynamic and realistic way. Because I think, you know, we walk down the street and we see these extraordinary people from all over the world. You know, we have great conversations um, and we have these extraordinary things happening in our lives. But then, yeah, you turn to our history books and it's just not there. Um, I mean, what's weird is it sort of is there. You know what I mean? Like you, you go back, you know, one of the very first bush rangers in Australia, like in colonial times, was a guy from, was a, 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 an African guy from, um, well, they actually don't really know where he's from. Um, so there's these extraordinary moments of these people you know, like even in those early days, Australia yeah. was extraordinarily dynamic. It's just somehow we've forgotten it and willfully sort of pushed it to the other end of our imagination. But we're ashamed of it. We're ashamed yeah. of it. And, you know, look, there are parts to be ashamed of, but it's not our fault. And so you can kind of look at, look at it differently when you just free yourself of that and just go, you know what, nobody alive. You know, when Cook got his orders right, you read Cook's orders and it's actually, it's, it's got in there um, that to look for mining resources and stuff mm. like that. And so when I look at all those FIFO workers in their busy vests and stuff, and I just think, you know, that, that, that identity was drawn out for us before Cook even landed here, mm. you know? And so the Australian identity, I think we've just, you know, what you were saying before about, you know, where these two stories connect, you know, I think the real, I mean, obviously, I, I don't want to go back to traditional times. I, I, I think we have the opportunity to take the best of both worlds. You know, I really liked your story about the clock, Jonathan, because to me, you know, I think the most obvious example of that is where we can take traditional ecological knowledge and bring it together with the best of Western science. And I think that there's, whole, there's a whole new journey of discovery to go on in terms of, and I think it's an interesting question for architects and engineers and designers, um, you know, as well as every other industry to start thinking about the Australian value system or, or for us to start designing new systems that take the best of both worlds, I think. 
Well, and I think that's the thing that often, and that was, you know, um, you know, often when I'm talking to people like, you know, um, architects, I, the thing that I'm interested in is when a building works, it's often because it's sitting on top of Aboriginal history that it responds to. Mm. Um, and you look at the opera house, you look at these things where um, when, when things work and things function, it's, it's because it's having a conversation with its past um, and encapsulating a new future. And by and large, that's only happened in Australia by fluke. It's <laughs> just so happened that someone was like, well, yeah, let's put it here. Um, and you know, and that's what's scary that like we've got Aboriginal people and, you know, I've said this time and time again, all through our history books, you can go through there at every moment there in Australia's history, there's been an Aboriginal person saying, if you want to know something, just ask, I'm here. I can tell you the story of this place. I can guide you to wherever you need to go. Just let me know what you need. And that's, that hasn't gone away. So if we want to make good buildings, if we want to make better cities, if we want to, you know, move forward and not fluke it like we do, um, have conversations with Aboriginal communities. Invite people in who are wanting to come into those conversations with you. Mm. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I think that's a perfect note to end the session on. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you so much again, Alison and Jonathan. It's so, um, so grateful that you guys uh, gave us your time and spoke about your two amazing projects. Um, I just have to also say to the, um, we have another session next Tuesday at the same time for the second and last lean in during Reconciliation Week. It's with Juliet Churchill at University of Sydney, and she will talk to us about the award winning strategy that they um, engaged in their buildings and spaces, Wingara Mura Bunga Barabugu, uh, which means a thinking path to make tomorrow. So uh, please tune in next week for that session because that will be just as amazing. So thank you again and yeah, bye. Thanks, Jonathan. Big love. Thank you. Yeah, congratulations. Bye, everyone. You've done a great work. See ya. Gotcha.